welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here on Think Tech Hawaii. And before I get started with my show, I want to plug one of the other hosts we have. We have Lillian's Lillian Gumick, uh, who does uh, Lillian's vegan cooking show here on Think Tech, has a book out. So make sure you look for that and maybe send her an email at Think Tech and see if you can get a copy of it. It's uh, got some great recipes in it, even though I'm a lot more um, carnivore than I am omnivore, um, and I'm certainly not a, a vegan, but she's got some great recipes in there and pretty tasty. I get to share some of them. Her husband worked with me, and uh, I got to share some of her food. And she, she's a good cook, so check out that book if you're looking for a Christmas present or something and you know some vegan. It's a really great book. Anyway, today's show is kind of a back to basic show. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've noticed that um, I get so into what's happening nowadays in in um, the industry, in the hydrogen industry, that I, I kind of forget that um, I have to step back sometimes and kind of refocus um, on what we're really, what our objective is with an energy manager show. So I want to kind of start off the show talking a little bit about just energy basics and it, you've heard me say this before if you're a regular stand energy energy man uh, viewer but if you think about energy and you think about it in terms of physics or chemistry there's the first law of thermodynamics which says energy can neither be created nor destroyed it just changes form and that's really, really important because what you don't realize is there's energy all around us every day, whether it's wind or solar, or believe it or not, just a big boulder sitting on top of a hill has energy, has potential energy. And if that boulder starts rolling down the hill, it has real energy. And when it hits the ground, and hopefully if it doesn't hit your house or something, it has real damage potential with kinetic energy. So even just what you think is an inanimate object sitting around still has the potential for energy. And so as we deal with energy as a source, it's, it's, it's not just energy, it's what kind of energy. And when we talk about energy in contemporary terms, we're usually talking gasoline for your car, or diesel fuel, or we're talking electricity from the grid. And so we, we tend to think of it um, as those kinds of energy and sometimes in the discussion and when we start looking at how we're going to do something we lose track of how important that kind of energy is and some of the characteristics of it for example you know we have cars that run on gasoline or diesel with internal combustion engines now they're really powerful they're they get us where we're going um, Fossil fuels are relatively cheap, so you can, you could, you know, fill up your car and go three, four hundred miles, maybe even five hundred miles on a tank, and it'll cost you maybe forty, fifty bucks. And you know, you can, you could go a long ways, especially on the mainland. You can, you can drive across the whole country um, in your car. And when you break it down to how much a mile it is, it's actually really cheap because gasoline has a lot of energy stored in each gallon, and you know, we go, that's pretty good, except that internal combustion engines in your car are very inefficient. They're only about 24 to 26 percent efficient at best. So you go, well, and if I'm burning all that gasoline and it's pretty cheap, but I'm only 24 percent efficient, where's the rest of the energy going? Most of it is going out of your car as heat. You're actually throwing away 70% or more of the energy in heat. In fact, that's kind of how you can tell how efficient something is, is does it generate a lot of heat aside from what you're asking it to do? So when we use fossil fuels, we tend to use, uh, and if we burn the fossil fuel to get our ultimate electricity or mechanical energy at our wheels on our car, if we're burning any kind of fuel, and we're creating heat along with whatever is getting us moving or getting our electricity going, 
we are probably not being very efficient. So also, we're putting out all that carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, all the all the greenhouse gases that we don't want to be putting out right now. So when we start talking today about clean energy, we're talking about energy that you create without using, without burning fossil fuels, because they're a big contributor to the greenhouse gas problem. So for example, what are some of the clean forms of energy that we've had around for ages? One is hydroelectric. Hoover Dam uh, on the California-Nevada border is, is amazing. It produces huge amounts of electricity, and all it is is water running through turbines. You know, it's, it's clean, it's efficient, the water's already there, but you have to dam up a big valley to make a big lake behind the dam to have that kind of hydroelectric. So every kind of energy you generate has a downside of some kind. And the whole, the whole problem today, or the whole challenge today, is balancing out the good and the bad. Balancing out whether you have to dam up a valley to make the energy, or if you have to have hazardous materials, or if you have to buy your materials from a place where child labor is being used, or there's other human, um, you know, human uh, rights violations and things like that, or you have, or those materials so rare and they're owned by other countries, so now you're dependent on other countries for things you need. There's all these trade-offs. So let's, but let's get real specific. For clean energy in the United States, you can start off with hydroelectric. And nowadays, there's more than just hydroelectric by dam. They have what they call in-stream hydroelectric. In other words, you put a device in a stream of water like a river, and it turns a generator, like, like if you had a, instead of having an engine on a boat turning a propeller, you just have a, a generator attached to a propeller where the, and it's anchored to the, to the ground or suspended by cables in the stream, and the water rushing by turns the propeller and generates electricity. That's in-stream hydro. The other one we're all really familiar with is solar power. Solar power is great, and because of the amount that's out there now and the technology has been improving and improving and improving, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And the sun is great because it covers so much of the earth, so much of the daylight hours, you can anywhere on the earth from pretty far north to pretty far south, you can get a quite a bit of energy from the sun. And those solar panels right now, they're doing like 15% efficiency. So even you're not even able to harness all of the, the power of the sun in electricity, but you can harness the heat from the sun in solar water heaters and things like that. And you have wind turbines. Not just the big ones that you see on the big mountainsides and and you know out in the in the Texas deserts and stuff, but you also have smaller ones that they call like vertical wind turbines or turbines built into the buildings that take uh, take um, advantage of the Venturi effect of the wind rushing around a building to to um, make the turbines move because anytime you have a big obstruction in a in an airstream, you have what they call a Venturi effect where the wind speeds up to get around it so it meets the same airflow on the other side. That gives you um, the, the, the energy to turn those turbines and give you electricity. So you have all those clean ways of doing it. Geothermal is one here in Hawaii that I think um, we're going to see more of, uh, at least I hope we do, because I think it'll make a huge economic impact for us. But those are all clean, carbon-free, they're not going to pollute the air kind of energy sources to make clean electricity. Now, we can move into the hydrogen piece. Why hydrogen, Stan? And I'll tell you why. Because hydrogen is the one element that is clean from beginning to end, especially if you use electrolysis to make it from water. It's clean. It's lightweight, so anytime you have to use it in transportation to generate power, there's, an, there's a definite advantage to not having a whole lot of weight to it. So in transportation, it's lightweight. 
It's a gas that's compressible, so you can cram a whole lot of gas with enough pressure to squeeze it in and put it in the car. But if you want to go to liquid hydrogen, um, and this is a, a figure I just came to last week after look, doing some research, a gallon of gasoline is equivalent to a kilogram of hydrogen. But if you have liquid hydrogen, that gallon of liquid hydrogen has almost four times the energy of a gallon of gasoline. So can you imagine a car that, that right now gets 300 miles per gallon, goes into hydrogen power, which is 60% efficient instead of 25% efficient, and has four times the energy in the hydrogen. Now that car is going 1,500 miles, a thousand, you know, more, way more than a thousand miles, and it's clean. It's all pollution free. Now, the other thing that's really, really, really important to understand about what's coming up in the future is whether you're talking transportation, which will be electric, or you're talking the grid which by design is electric, we're going to need a lot more electricity. And the problem with electricity as an energy thing is that if you're not using it when you make it, you have to store it somehow. So how do you store energy? There's a number of ways to do it. We already know about batteries. You can store energy in batteries. You can store energy by pumping water uphill and letting it flow through turbines coming downhill. You can compress air and do the same thing you do with the water turbines. Compress air with a compressor and you have extra energy. And then when you don't have the energy available, like it's nighttime or something, you take that compressed air and run it through turbines and it gives you electricity back. There's all kinds of ways to store energy. But one of the most useful and efficient and clean ways to store energy is in hydrogen. Why hydrogen? Number one, when you make hydrogen with electricity, you're also making pure oxygen, which has an industrial gas value, medical gas. You need, you need oxygen in hospitals, like especially during the coronavirus. You need pure oxygen, medical. That's what you get when you're making hydrogen. Welders need hydrogen. Steel production, they all need hydrogen and oxygen. When you're splitting water to make hydrogen, you're also making oxygen. So that's one thing. Number one, like I said, it's lightweight in transportation. It's great. And on the grid, when you have too much production from your solar and wind, instead of trying to tune all that wind and solar down or shut it off, you just divert all that electricity into electrolyzers and make as much hydrogen as you can while the sun's out and store it so that at night or when it's cloudy or when it's raining or snowing, now you have the energy stored there and it comes back to you as what we call firm power. In other words, it's just, it's not intermittent. You can use it when you want. You can use as much of it as you want. It's always there because it's stored up and it's efficient. So that's why we really, really like hydrogen as a stored energy source. It's not the only one. We're still gonna need batteries. We're still gonna wanna look at hydroelectric dams and we're still gonna look at pumped hydro for storage. But that's why hydrogen is so great. When you get to super large scales, batteries are too expensive. Um, they actually have some safety issues and we aren't gonna be able to make that many batteries to put in all our cars and on the grid and solve all our problems. And the battery technology we have now is, is really pretty much peaked out. Um, and we're gonna have to have a different kind of battery technology in the future at some point and scientists are still working on that. So we're gonna take a quick break right now, and then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. And the first video is one that most people haven't seen before, and I'll explain why that is. The next two you've probably seen here before, but they're really primers on hydrogen. But we'll be back in 60 seconds. Thank you. 
Thanks, thanks for uh, coming back to Stan Energy Man here. This first video, uh, not a whole lot of people have seen it, but it was a video that we produced for the state of Hawaii <clears throat> on a really important project we were doing at Hickam. And when we finished the video, the Air Force actually changed its policy on one of the energy sources we were, we were testing. So they didn't want to release this video but I still think it's a really great video. So the, the policy change was we had in our microgrid at Hickam, we had a gasifier to do waste to energy. And that gasifier was rated at 10 tons a day, which the military figured was a good size for about a thousand people and the kind of operations that they did. And the more they looked at it, the more they said this, this is just not efficient. We can't get, we, it's too expensive to run. It's too big, it's too cumbersome. And the technology really doesn't hit its sweet spot till you're at like at least a hundred tons a day. And for, for real, real term purposes, you gotta really be closer to thousands of tons a day to make that technology work. So just ignore the waste energy pieces of the video and, um, but watch the rest of it. It's really the key to why we were developing the what we call flight line of the future for the Air Force. So we can roll that video. What does the power grid of the future look like? As advancements in energy rapidly outpace the modernization of the current infrastructure, answering this question is more crucial than ever. Let's start by looking at the needs of our military. Right now, Hundreds of U.S. bases around the globe rely primarily on large utility grids powered by nuclear, coal, and oil energy. Many of these grids are built on aging infrastructures. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave bases vulnerable to grid failures. A new system, the first of its kind in the DOD, is being developed that will allow unprecedented control over how energy is generated, stored, and distributed, and it's called PEARL. The Pearl system uses renewable energy technologies deployed within a series of interconnected microgrids, which provide localized fuel and power generation and energy storage. This level of energy control is safer and more efficient. Excess energy can be stored on site and easily moved from one grid to another. The energy can be used when and where it's needed, even as the mission changes. Pearl improves energy security by producing fuel on site. This security is further enhanced by eliminating single points of failure. Overall, Pearl greatly improves survivability and resiliency. The Air Force and the state of Hawaii have been partnering for many years in pushing renewable energy technology. The Pacific Energy Assurance and Renewable Laboratory at Hickam Air Force Base started construction in 2017. And what Pearl is designed to do is be a demonstration laboratory for all of the Air Force and really all of the Department of Defense to push tomorrow's energy technologies to be deployable sooner. We're looking for cost-effective, resilient, cleaner energy. So the vision of the future that Pearl really brings into reality is a much more dynamic system of distributed power generation with distributed power consumption. And frankly, in the world of the military, that kind of agile self-healing can act as a deterrent to attack. Pearl also supports the National Guard mission, which of course is absolutely critical in the face of a natural disaster that may cause a wider grid outage. So ensuring that the airbase has energy assurance 24 seven, regardless of what's happening with the wider grid, is good for the entire Hawaii community. There are real lessons that can come out of Pearl that can not only be spread to the rest of the military, but really can be spread across the United States. 
Pearl functions as a technology and business laboratory, complementing the state of Hawaii's mandated transition to 100% renewable by 2045 by reducing the import of energy. Pearl demonstrates energy assurance and resilience across the entire Department of Defense while reducing fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions. Pearl will support minimizing solid waste and enhancing sustainability management practices for the DOD and the country. Continuing our dependence on energy that is unstable, insecure, and inefficient is not an option. Pearl is a holistic solution that is clean, resilient, and efficient. Pearl will set a new precedent for our future infrastructure by providing mission assurance through energy assurance. So I hope you really enjoyed that video. It's really, uh, it was really the video that we wanted funded. Um, and then the next video that we're gonna show is one of the other videos that was kind of added to the project. Um, we have two actually that we added in, one on microgrids and one on hydrogen. I don't know if we're gonna have time for the, the microgrid one, but we should have time for the hydrogen one. But in that Pearl microgrid complex, um, we had solar and wind turbines. Uh, and just, you saw that one run round wind turbine that was there. That was a beautiful wind turbine that we tested. We actually had it on a trailer. And um, if you didn't know it, when you have wind turbines on an airfield, it interferes with the approach control radar and some of the other radar around the, the um, facility. So we had to test this thing in a bunch of different locations to see if it interfered with the FAA's radar or the Air Force's radar on the base and design a system that was um, easy to assemble, easy to transport, easy to set up at a foreign location or a deployed location and still give you, you know, good power. Solar, we had a lot of solar. We have, in fact, we probably have more solar at Pearl Harbor Hickam then we need to, we, we don't need anything else but the solar to run, run the base pretty much. Um, we were hoping that the waste energy would also give us not only an advantage in um, giving us some extra electricity, but also help us to get rid of hazardous waste, classified material, things like that. But we just couldn't make it all come together with the waste energy project. Again, mostly because of scale. But the storage of the energy was a little bit of storage in batteries, which is important. Batteries are great to help you smooth out your power on your microgrid. But then the long-term storage, the big storage was in hydrogen. Why hydrogen? Because you also ran all your ground support vehicles. All those vehicles in the video were vehicles that run off of hydrogen fuel cells. They're all electric vehicles. They use a hydrogen fuel cell to take hydrogen and air with the oxygen in the air. The air that we breathe is, is not 100% oxygen. It's only about 16 to 18% oxygen. And a fuel cell can use either pure oxygen or the air's oxygen to generate electricity and make water. So you could start off with solar power, make hydrogen, make oxygen, store it, and then turn it around and use it in your vehicles or turn it around to make electricity for your facilities and keep on going and keep on going. You never have to have diesel fuel, never have to have gasoline. You just run all your ground vehicles off of hydrogen fuel cells and electricity and you run your grid on your base. And you can disconnect it all from the grid, be off grid. You can even keep it cyber secure by isolating who controls that microgrid from a LAN, a local area network, instead of the internet. Really, really important for the DOD. Well, before we run out of time, let's show the second video, which uh, is the hydrogen video. And it kind of ties it all together and brings the hydrogen story into the picture. There are over 300 million people in our country, and the vast majority rely on large-scale, centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging, and it is vulnerable. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. 
renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission, especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain. And they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs, keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple. With the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation, now our old grid struggled to keep up. We require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. That gives you a picture of where the hydrogen fits in on the microgrid. But in the vehicles, like we had in the first video, you saw the big tug vehicle and the bus. We had weapons loaders. We had um, pumper trucks to move fuel from the, what we call the hydrant, fuel hydrants on base into the wings of the airplane to get them fuel on board. We had all those vehicles change from diesel drivetrains to electric drivetrains with hydrogen fuel cell and battery technology to drive them. Now, there's you use the hydrogen and the battery in combination in vehicles. And one time, if you want to use, um, if you want to maximize your power, you might have a battery dominant with a fuel cell range extender, which is what most of our vehicles were. But if you want to have a um, a really responsive, really powerful car that can go a long, long way, you might have a, a fuel cell dominant um, vehicle with a really powerful fuel cell and a fairly small battery that just gives you that burst of uh, acceleration at the front end. It gives you long, long travel distances and stuff. That's why you see most of the big trucks that are coming out now are going to be not battery powered, but they'll be hydrogen fuel cell powered. So I hope that kind of brings you back up to speed on hydrogen in a little bit more practical sense. And I appreciate you joining us today at Think Tech Hawaii and uh, learning a little bit more about hydrogen. So until next week, Dan the Energy Man signing off and aloha. <music>